we'll be correcting this in this uh, in this thing once this call is over. But here are the references. They are cited like this. And if you need to use them in your in your text, what you do is, is, is you just use this bracket form without the colon and put this wherever you think it's being cited. And that's based on the plagiarism rules that we have clearly posted and that you ought to be here as an example. Um, um, how, how to do this. That's all you need to do. Super simple, super trivial. And these examples are, and I apologize that in this particular person, this person has added an image and he hasn't added the image correctly. I will be, I will be fixing this. And uh, he is doing this because he wants to see this in, 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 in GitHub. I, 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 I fixed this for him. And now let's go back to the other thing. Here is now a sample with image inclusion. So you go in there, as you can see, we're using the same template, all the same stuff here at the beginning. And then when it comes down to the image inclusion, what, what, we, what we do is, well, where is it? Here. What we do is, 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 is we declare a figure, in this case, figure two, and there is a hyperlink added to this. However, this hyperlink goes out into the raw um, GitHub uh, location where the image is being located. And the image is located in an images directory. And then the only thing that they have to do is, is, is add a figure two to the caption. This has as an advantage when we, when we go to this particular document that it's renderable in, um, a, a, let's, let's take a look at three or five. See, we, we can search for three or five here. And we can take a look at this. As you can see, there's an edit button here. If I click on this edit button, a new window pops up and I'm immediately standing in this editing. This helps the TAs to uh, put comments in. Uh, the abstract is automatically rendered. Automatically, a table of contents is being included. And when you take a look at this, this is the figure is included, including figure number one and figure number two here. And um, the student even has references. Super trivial. We essentially give you exactly what you need to do. Are there any questions about this template? So now let's go. Let's go to uh, 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 which student was this? Fao. Fao. Fao Zan. Fao Zan. Fao Zan. So let's go here. You no. Know, um, let's take a look at this. There is no uh, edit link. There is no uh, table of contents. The abstract is not in a gray box. Um, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, not put the colon behind the uh, behind the number four. Since there's no edit in here, I can't click on the edit button to 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 edit your report. So I have to I have to explicitly now go to uh, cyber training. Uh, so this makes it more complicated for the uh, for the students, right? So so I have to I have to go to the GitHub repository, and uh, this all costs time, and we don't need that. You know, you can uh, you can just uh, follow our uh, what this what was it? Thousand. What's your number? Three or five? Three one three. Yeah. Three one three. Three one three. So we can we can go to your repository and we can take a look uh, how your uh, the project looks like. So uh, this looks pretty all right, but the problem is is, is we are not doing VisiVic. We are not looking at you know this. We are looking at what is your detail. As you can see, here there are no spaces included. Spaces, spaces, right? As you. This is a rule in Markdown. Any context change needs to be followed by an empty line so that it's easier for other programs to parse this. So uh, uh, now here you're using a, a reference number six. If you were to use our, uh, 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 our proper Markdown uh, 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 example, 
that we that we gave you, you wouldn't have done this, but you would have done this with the number six. And now here, uh, they are all now followed. And now uh, the, the sixth reference probably is being included. It doesn't work in the rendering in github.com, but it will work um, in, in, in the other, other thing. And as you can see, this, this is really simple. Only thing that you have to do is, is, is on the top, fix this, fix this top section here. You know, following our template, only thing you have to do. And I'm saving this now, saving you some work. And uh, now as you, as you see, as, 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 as you will then not see that the number six works here, but when I, but it shows up like this. And when I generate the website, I can, uh, uh, Jeffrey, if you're coming back, let me know. Okay? Yeah, I'm back here. Uh... Oh, oh, I didn't, I didn't know, I, you didn't say that. I can demonstrate you how I create the website. Um, I, 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 I go to my cyber aid thing and it's really simple. I say git pull and uh, now you can uh, uh, see that everything is already up to date. Now I can say, create me my website and I create now the entire website uh, from, um, uh, from this and I can say, uh, and make view and, um, or, or uh, actually, I, I need to, I need to start the server, which I haven't done yet. Uh, so I'm now starting the server, and uh, now I can, for example, say here localhost on the uh, website, and now I'm just uh, viewing basically uh, what you normally have on the web page locally. So you can even create this all locally if you want to do this. Um, but that's, that's not required. What's required is, is that you just follow our simple templates. Are there questions to this? Yeah, okay. So uh, I tried to create the table, con table content by copying the, the format in the sample, but- Let me demonstrate this. I copy, I copy. I copy this. Now I go to your website, uh, to, to your report. Which number was this again? 312. So I go to uh, the website, 312, uh, 313. I go to the project. Yes, yeah, sorry, 312. I go to project.md. I edit this. I passed this example that I'm now copying just from, from your colleague over here. You know, I know that you have other keywords. So I put here to be determined. And uh, the abstract you had already filled out. So I just delete that abstract to be determined. And, um, and then we have a title, the title you have here. I move the title over. Right now, uh, this is something that you that you that we need to do. Just like you know, you can just copy your name here, copying it over. So now we change this number to three one three, right? Three one three. And since you have the same uh, project directory, that's the reason why we all do this. We don't have to do anything else. So now we just delete this. We move the abstract over. As you can see, there is nothing special I'm doing. It's super trivial. I just copied everything and I'm saving this. And now you're in compliance with the template. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, the table of content is not showing in the GitHub. That's why uh, I deleted it. It's posted in Piazza. GitHub has an inferior mechanism of using Markdown. And we are using um, a website generator, which I've just demonstrated uh, you how I'm using this, that uh, and adds this table of content automatically. It adds the page info automatically. That's the purpose of these macros. It's like a little programming language for, for web pages. 
GitHub doesn't know how to do this. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks. Sorry for uh, Jeffrey for taking such a long time. Oh no, it's, this, this is pretty interesting. This 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 uh, this uh, this uh, um, simplifies for everybody. Every no one has to worry about table of contents or page info. The integration into the website is done automatically. There are scripts running in the background, so whenever someone's checking something in, for example, I can I can now now see this. I, I can say make uh, update. So this is how I, for example, figure out, oh, uh, maybe it's make pull. Uh, now it goes out to the GitHub repository automatically and uh, gets all the changes from all students. And this is the reason why I can handle 30, 40 students per, per hour because not 30 students are committing at the same time. But I see now, for example, that 326 has made an update, that 343 has made an update, and uh, that we have um, um, uh, some updates here in 312. And here is your update in 3, 313. This now means I can just simply create the websites within one minute and update it. And that's what I do multiple times during the day. Um, we promise to do it only once a week, but uh, uh, you can all run this locally. If you really are needing to see this, how it looks like, you can uh, check out the GitHub repository. There is a README in the cyber training website. So if you go to the cyber training, uh, there, is this, there is this website here. And there is a README in here, which describes in um, a reasonable amount of detail what I'm doing. Okay, um, back to Jeffrey. Okay. All right, so let's uh, get, uh, I was, any more questions? Otherwise I'll go and finish the cloud summary uh, slides. All right, let's see. All right, so we were um, going through the summary. The, the uh, the looking at the cloud computing unit for videos was part of the assignment, and here I'm just doing a summary of that unit, and I got halfway through the summary uh, last time, and the next section is called cloud software, and um, this starts off with this uh, rather low quality picture of a table I made in 2016 which was um, trying to keep track of all the software that was. And so here we have um, 350 software packages and probably they're double that now. Um, I just stopped in 2016 accumulating them and I divided them into these um, various categories. <clears throat> and um, it's sort of impressive in my opinion, how much software there is. Nearly all of this, some of there's some commercial software here, um, but there's also a lot of it is open source. Uh, much of it coming from Apache, but from other open source uh, organizations as well. And uh, here's a nice graph that uh, Google likes to show when they're t telling you how wonderful they are. And um, Google has made lots of important uh, innovations, which actually have, nearly all of which have uh, turned into um, open source software. So Google file system is shown here the first in 2002. The, uh, the image here on the, on the uh, top right is uh, taken from a Google talk 
and it shows on the timeline the software they have and um you can see they have there's hdfs is based on google file system apache hadoop on MapReduce, um hbase on big table drill on demo giraffe on prego crunch on flume java a colossus is a better hdfs and spanner and f1 don't actually have such all similar to cockroach uh, database system, but they are very sophisticated uh, database systems. Millwheel is one I'm more familiar with because it's uh, based on it's just the uh, software for um, streaming software for coping with the uh, data coming from IoT devices and being transmitted to the cloud for processing. And here was actually, this is one of the mill wheels, one of the few cases where Google was not first. Uh, Twitter, which produced Storm and Heron, uh, was actually uh, significantly ahead of Google. And in fact, there were other systems. SAMHSA is another system similar to, uh, to Storm. Um, and then in 2015, the final one shown here is Cloud Dataflow, which became Apache Beam. And this doesn't cover all. Uh, Google didn't do everything, but they did quite a lot. And in fact, we should have, they didn't put it on their table, but they have the major contribution to DevOps in Kubernetes, which is possibly the most important of these technologies. But they didn't put it on there. They didn't themselves uh, identify it. Here are a few slides about MapReduce. I think I mentioned earlier the MapReduce in retrospect is obvious, but uh, it's often the best inventions are the obvious inventions. Because um, it required the insight of uh, Jeffrey Dean and his colleagues at um, Google to realize that actually you could do large scale data processing and database parallel databases with this MapReduce concept. And there's a huge number of citations. This was probably uh, written a couple of weeks ago. It's probably now increased. Well, it's certainly increased. Um, and I say it's a it would, uh, It's interesting. It started raining quite hard here. It, was, it wasn't meant to rain at this time of day. It was meant to be later today. Anyway, if you hear any noise, that's the rain hitting my hitting my room. Um, <coughs> And MapReduce is the sort of archetypical called big data processing system, and it does it in a pretty straightforward fashion. Uh, by taking divide and it, which fashion is actually, as we'll discuss later on, actually the typical way parallel computing was always done. But the people who like me who did parallel computing initially didn't look at big data systems. We looked at um, large scale simulations. And MapReduce, not surprisingly, has two parts, Map and Reduce. And here is a nice picture from Judy about uh, showing it in operation. You have your data on the left, which is split into parts. Here we have three parts. Each part goes to a worker, which basically processes that data. So what could it be doing? Well, it could be, um, um, the data could be a list of uh, web, web information and each worker could be testing to see whether a particular search search query was present in that web data. Then uh, the workers do their work. Mapping is working or computing. And um, so those are the map, those workers are the mappers and they're controlled by the overall user program. Uh, they write their data locally, the results of the computing. Those, com those uh, if we had, for instance, uh, these were looking for um, satisfaction of search queries, you will want to add the results together of each worker. If one worker has five results, the next worker six, the next worker three, you want to add the um, 14 results together. And that is, that's called reduction. Reduction doesn't always reduce information, it can also uh, it typically, it actually often adds them together, but it's a, 
a collective operation which works on all the results of these workers and produces a single output, which it could be, if it's large enough, be divided between multiple workers. Often, actually, in the default, you have a single produce worker. So that's map produce. Um, this slide here um, sort of compares what a supercomputer does with what a big data system does. And it actually does, if you, that first slide I started with today had uh, the 350 software packages divided into areas, which areas are shown on the, on the uh, left of the yellow insert here, the orchestration libraries and so on. Those are the divisions I had in the uh, original diagram. And then we have here typical entries for big data that you would orchestrate using Beam, and then an HPC system would typically use Pegasus or, or a Kepler. Uh, then you would have libraries, which um, just because you're doing different problems is likely to be different between big data and simulations. Languages, uh, which are also somewhat different. Um, these platform as a service, um, the streaming information. There is no streaming data typically in a supercomputer. Parallelism is actually big data has now started to use MPI, which is the default in simulations much more. And all the state of the art big data systems now have MPI in them. In 2016 or whenever I first drew this picture, that wasn't true. Data management is actually pretty different. HBase, MongoDB and all the standard cloud databases, those are not typically run in supercomputers. Data transfer, actually that's a weakness of the big data people. They don't have good data transfer systems. They use HTTP, but that doesn't work for large files. And so it's, it's not, I'm a little surprised they don't actually address that problem. Um, and Globus is uh, an, old, an old project from Chicago, which is very successful. And the most uh, popular product is a data transfer system. Scheduling, well, actually you can see this is an old slide because it has Mesos. And Mesos was officially sort of retired about a couple of years ago. It basically lost out to Kubernetes. And uh, I should actually add Kubernetes to this slide because um, I didn't have it because I didn't do DevOps in this slide, but Kubernetes also does a lot of, does a, this is effectively a replacement for Mesos. Then you can see uh, different file systems and formats and things like that. All right. So there's actually a lot of differences because these worlds are just grown up differently with different trade-offs and some features like um, Zookeeper, which is a <coughs> coordination system to keep track of concurrency and uh, is just not typically used in simulation. So you will not see it um, in the simulation area. Caching is more important for data than it is for simulation. Here are a couple of slides that we produced in our own project, which told you what type of um, components you need in a big data system. And um, you need, and they usually look at the thing called component. Um, <coughs> we have you know, that you need to support parallel computing. You need to have these um, points where you coordinate information and you collect data together and things like that. Uh, you need to understand how to use um, containers, processes, and threads. You uh, may need to move task around, especially if you have elasticity. You need to support streaming. You actually need to decide how you do your execution, whether you use processes, threads, and queues. Uh, we have scheduling and graphs, because the tasks are typically arranged into graphs. So this is the last slide of these two, and these just illustrate the other. These are just effectively the components of a big data architecture. You need to do some communication and communication here is um, divided into three types. There is the messaging, which you do in streaming data where you do so usually do publish subscribe. You have uh, 
the, the, the data flow communication, which is well supported, for instance, in Spark. And um, that is that has a different semantics from the messaging used in MPI, which is typically called bulk synchronous processing, which is a lot of organized collective messages with lots of processes and messages to lots of other processes. Uh, we have the different uh, data models, uh, file systems, SQL, NoSQL, or streaming data. Those are all uh, different ways of bringing the data to the program. You have to manage the data and it's typically it's distributed and it's uh, in memory, out of memory. It can be mutable or immutable. There, Spark made a major contribution with RDDs and Heron has a similar concept called Streamlet. Heron is Heron superseded Storm. It's uh, Twitter's, and it's now Apache, but it, it came from Twitter and it was there. It's the, what Twitter uses for, man, for collecting tweets. And of course, there are issues, important issues of fault tolerance, which is very difficult to do. It's very hard to make things fault tolerant because think, so many things can break and also things can break, can look as though they're broken, but aren't actually broken. And security is a mess. In fact, I was late for this. You see, I had to log out of this class because I somehow didn't log in through my IU account. And so, um, it didn't realize I was allowed to, to, to take charge of this session. So I had to log out and log in through IU. All right. Here is a little, actually, this is not a, the, the um, big lectures have more on applications. Here, I just have a little discussion of uh, the Internet of Things. So here is a sort of typical diagram of the, of the so-called Internet of Things which um, consists of a cloud or a soup, let's call it the data center stuff in the middle. That's some giant collection of um, computers which is gonna manage the world. And then around that you have uh, devices on the edge from laptops, cell phones, emails, hospitals and so on. And then there's this important concept, which actually was always done, but it just didn't get the name. I, I did a lot of work on this a few years ago. I made the mistake of not giving it a name. I should have called it Fogs and Cloudlets because that's how they got known. And those were actually, we did those things before they were given that name. Anyway, Fog is very straightforward. Fog is the computers which manage the local devices and you need those computers for a trivial reason. You can't afford to spend um, hundreds of milliseconds running back and forth to your cloud if you're, um, if you're making decisions in real time. So self-driving cars and robots and things have to have local computing. That can, computing can be like your car can have a GPU to do its image processing. If your uh, IoT device is a little smaller, uh, um, it might, can't have a significant computer on it. And so maybe the uh, local computers are just stored in some, uh, some place which is near you, near the device, but not on the device. So that's the fog. And as far as I know, the architecture on the right is the default architecture. <coughs> and people work on making the fog look like the cloud. Because if you're sitting in the device, you don't want to have to worry too much about where your data is going to be processed. And if you, if it's processed locally, it should give the, have the same interfaces of its process in the cloud. And um, I think I've already said that. Um, I noticed an important thing we learned when we did so-called grid computing, namely, there's a lot of very difficult technical issues, but there's also a sort of political issue, namely who owns the computers? Uh, so I give the, the usual example I give is your is self-driving cars. All right, so here you are, you're in a bit of a stressful situation. Uh, the uh, giant truck is about to collide with you and your car wants to know what to do. Well, it probably doesn't really want to borrow that computing from the truck. 
Uh, that doesn't sound a very reasonable thing to do. Uh, or from even a neighbor, a neighboring car, that is just too dangerous. So it's pretty important when you look at the fog to make certain you not only have a computer, but also a computer that you own enough rights on so that, <coughs> that you can do, order that computer to do what you want it to do. And so that's why I say the fog is best uh, it's easiest to use if the fog systems are in the same administrative domain as the cloud and the device. And um, that is not the view that everybody takes. That I've seen uh, there is clear, there is interesting work which effectively assume the fog is everything. I mean, when your cars are milling around on the freeway, they can borrow each other's computers and do all that type of thing to make the best decision. Um, okay. So now we can't, we, this, that plot, uh, those, those diagrams illustrate the importance of streaming because we need to get the data from the edge to the cloud, which can be, as I said, it is a non trivial time and it's an important step. And so the processing of data that is being pumped from multiple edge devices to the cloud, that's called streaming. And it would often stream, at a, like if you have video, it's streaming 30 times a second uh, for, for say highest high, high -ish, uh, quality video. And they can be actually like a colleague's works on racing data from the IndyCar racers. Those those are actually streamed off. Some of that data streamed at much faster rates than that. Uh, other times it can be streamed slower. I think if your refrigerator is sending its uh, data back to the manufacturer, it would not do it 30 times a second. You can do it every now and then. So an important issue in streaming is um, um, is the frequency with which it's going on, and like people tweeting, they're not going. Even Trump doesn't tweet several times a second. I don't think, maybe once a second. I have no idea. But um, that's uh, the challenge of these systems. Depends quite a bit on the on how fast they are being updated and how fast you need to process them. Um, <clears throat> I once remember a long time ago, must have been over 20 years ago, one of the very earliest search engine P, uh, in entrepreneurs from, uh, it, was a, it was a company called Inktomi, I-N-K-T-O-M-I, -I, was purchased by somebody. And he, he, he was explaining that uh, the critical requirement of the search engine that they gave the answer in a quarter of a second. It wasn't so important the answer was correct, precisely, it was needed to be as nearly correct, but it had to be there in a quarter of a second. And of course that's interacting with in semi real time with people. So all these problems have time constraints, which are quite important. If you take say the systems like Storm and Heron, they're all built around publish subscribe. If you look at publish and subscribe, you will find they take about a millisecond to process information. Well, a millisecond is, is much less than a quarter of a second, so you can use publish subscribe. <coughs> so when you design these systems, you need to know what your constraints are. If you were, um, so a quarter of a second is the search engine, the car, the, your self-driving car avoiding the truck, that is probably, uh, millisecond or, or less. I mean, it has to be done really quickly because there's so little time to make corrective actions. So different problems have different times. Here is a slide I've used a long many times with in different forms. And they tried to illustrate um, different uh, ways of putting together uh, components into a job. Um, on the on the left, we have the so-called map-only job. They're using the language of MapReduce, and so you have these are. If you remember the slides, I the slide I said came from Judy Chu. 
Well, we have the maps, the maps through the computing. Well, there is a type of computing which um, is just doing maps and it does lots of them. An example is you are um, um, doing a lot of computations sim simultaneously to search for something. There's a famous program called BLAST, which compares DNA sequences with databases. Each of those BLAST uh, comparisons can be done independently. So that's called map only. Then you have map produced where the map only is followed by a consolidation stage for, with a reduction operation. Uh, then we have uh, another class of those is, is the same, but is iterative. After you do the first reduction, you need to keep going because the map was refining some numbers and those numbers need to keep on being refined till they converged. That's very common in optimization in when you do a uh, TensorFlow and run deep learning, it actually goes through many iterations. Uh, once per, per batch, it's, it's updating the weight. So it's actually running iteratively. And iteratively is much, is much, is very challenging because of the time, again, the time constraint. Typically you need to do these things um, coordinated across the different uh, different uh, parts of the program. And when you do iteration, no part of the program can fall behind because if one falls behind, everybody falls behind. Um, in the case of um, say TensorFlow, you're not allowed to update part of the, well, you might be able to, but typically you don't update part of the weights and then proceed. You update all the weights. You update them on parts of that stochastic gradient descent opera does it on part of the data set, but they update all the weights. Uh, another class of problem is when you're processing graphs where you have a collection of points which send, need to communicate with each other. That's also seen in large scale simulations. And that's called, I call that the point to point or map communication model. That is dominant in large exascale simulations. Then we have the streaming model and um, the streaming model is what they what you would use in Storm or, or Heron or or to process tweets and things. You have the data, the data is streaming in continuously. So these maps are not getting the data and then running. They're running continuously. If you pro the date the the jobs that process tweets are just running the whole time, and they're just the tweets are just being plonked into the into the uh, processing stream. And the final category called shared memory is a pretty special comment on parallel computing because there are some problems like large, large databases where a shared memory is helpful. Typically the, in the other cases here, we, I've drawn these blobs separately because each map has its own memory and it does not communicate. In fact, the only communication are these arrows which I show here in the reduction phase or the point to point phase here. That's those are communication sets. Otherwise, there is no shared memory. And building a shared memory is just expensive and uh, reduces the possible parallelism. Um, okay, well, here is a, a comment, a, a more comment on the difference in big data and simulations. And uh, when you, when you, um, discuss those, diff those differences, you need to distinguish data and model. When, when I used to do simulations only and not big data, we actually use the term data to represent what is now called the model, because we felt we always look called the numerical approximation uh, of, the, um, of the model as data, but that's not, uh, that's a little imprecise these days, because we should reserve the word data to, for the, for real, for more appropriate data. And so, but every, oh, actually um, simulations and big data problems, both have data and model and um, they just have different sizes. For a simulation, the data is, tends to be initial conditions and relatively small. And for big data, the data is possibly dominant. And uh, even for databases, you have, uh, data, which is the database, and the model is the query.
Um, and here is again simulations. Um, can also be thought of as data plus model, as I said. And there are some differences, like um, whether the data is static or dynamic, and <clears throat> what things change. The model typically has parameters, like in TensorFlow, you're changing your weights from uh, epoch to, from batch to batch. And anyway, I would say that this type of analysis. <coughs> tells you that there's not a lot of difference between big data and simulations in terms of general architecture. There is a lot of difference in detail because the sizes are so different. All right, so here is some pretty old slides. So they, may, they start off by discussing parallel computing. And uh, the key to parallel computing is very simple. You take a single problem and divide it up into parts. And um, though each, each time you use parallel computing, you have to decide what you divide up. Um, and um, if you're doing computer chess, you divide up the chess positions and assign each position to, uh, at the start of a tree to a different uh, computing system. Um, when you, uh, I used to work on the so-called strategic defense initiative, where we were trying to build um, defense systems for missiles. And we would do parallel computing by assigning each missile to a different computer. And then those missiles were analyzed in detail by individual computers. Uh, with tweet in Twitter, you would just put each tweet or a set of tweets on the different computers. And DNA fragments, you put different DNA fragments. You break up the whole DNA into sets of DNA, subsets of DNA fragments and put each of them on a separate computer. When you're doing documents and say topic analysis to do Google News or um, other similar types of, um, of um, web, web resources, then you put each dot, you divide the documents into groups and put each group on a separate computer. So the heart of parallel computing is aimed at decomposing data. And I also showed you that on the picture of MapReduce. You started off that picture of MapReduce for Judy, she had uh, divided the data into three, just in this sort of example she had. And that's always done. You always divide the data up and you have to divide it up in a way so that the workload for each group of data is, is similar. Um, and of course, we have a huge sort of amount of parallelism possible because we might have a cloud with up to 100,000 servers in it, and each of those can be uh, doing part of the job. Um, and then, and a good example of parallelism is just people accessing the cloud from their um, uh, from the phone or tablet or at laptop. Each of those accesses is corresponds to taking the set of people. You divide, take the set of people, you divide the people into groups, and each node of the, of the cloud, each one core in the cloud ha handles one person. Uh, so this is uh, one form of parallelism. It's actually a pretty simple form because those, each of those users can be processed independently. Um, okay, so and. Everything can be thought of in this fashion. And the, and the only difference is sometimes the parts of the problem are reasonably closely integrated. When we do simulations, the different parts of the uh, simulation are linked together. So at the moment it's raining and actually it's just stopped raining in Bloomington. Uh, but if we were doing a weather forecast, we would divide the atmosphere up into parts and each part would be processed by a different computer. But to make a serious prediction, the, uh, com the computers need to communicate with each other. So the edge information from the computer doing Bloomington is transmitted to the uh, uh, computer doing uh, Martinsville and Indianapolis up north of us. And so you need communication because they're all solving the same equations. <coughs> Um, so again, you know, if we're doing, um, well, let's take uh, computational fluid dynamics and aircraft. 
Um, you divide the air into parts. If you look at uh, your airplane, which is flying, you will see there is turbulence. That turbulence comes because um, there's an incredibly rapid variation of the parameters of the uh, air near the wing surfaces because the poor old uh, air has to be uh, traveling at the speed of the plane on the surface and it's sort of traveling at the speed of the wind away from the air surface. So there's a very rapid variation in properties of the air and that's done by a very small band of air, which uh, sometimes you can see from the from your window, which is sitting next to the uh, the, the wing and the fuselage and things. And that is actually incredibly hard to program and design algorithms for because there's that rapid variation says that you need a lot more computing just near the wing than you do far away from the wing. So actually the division of um, data, uh, these are the uh, parts of the, you divided the atmosphere up into, into parts and you the parts, you have to have many more parts near the wing than you do, especially the tip of the wing than you do elsewhere. Some problems are much easier than that. Um, like for web pages, I, uh, I, doubt, I suspect you can have, do a pretty uniform distribution of web pages. So these slides I did in, I don't know, 1985 probably. And uh, it was because some journalists asked me about parallel computing and I, I to, I made these uh, slides, which are, say, pretty old now. How many years old are they? They're uh, 35 years old. So, and it was trying to say that uh, the study of parallel computing was actually the study of society, because uh, what does society do? It actually tries to make people harmoniously work together and live together. So that's sort of a challenge of parallel of society, and that's the challenge of parallel computing. You have to divide the job up so that the parts of the different parts, different computer units working on the same problem work harmoniously together. And when you do that, <coughs> you do not hire a super, when you have a big problem, you do not um, hire Superman, because Superman doesn't actually exist. Rather, you put together a team of ordinary people. And uh, I illustrated this with uh, Hadrian's Wall. Um, for those who are not like me coming from the United Kingdom, Hadrian was a Roman emperor. He was annoyed by the Scots who were in the north of England. I happen to be born in Scotland, so I'm on their side. And um, they were bugging him. They were Celtic and uh, he was trying to run. He was trying, the Romans had conquered England, but not Scotland. And so he put up a wall between England and Scotland, at least he tried to. And here is a discussing how Hadrian would build his wall in a fast fashion. So to build a wall in a fast fashion, you have a lot of masons who build more bricklayers who build the wall and you just do a lot of them. You, uh, and they build the wall simultaneously. And you can see from this picture what happens when you're building a wall. When you have these different sections assigned to different people, in the middle of the section, <coughs> the wall can be built without any trouble. But there is an overlap area, which is roughly the size of an arm's length. If you're a distance, I don't know, three meters. So there's a distance at the end of each section, which is three meters, when the two blick rays have to talk to each other. So this says that when you, um, want to build a wall efficiently, you want to divide it into area, into lengths, which are where the overlap area, which is three meters, is, um, is uh, much smaller than the length, because when the poor old bricklayer is, lay is building the wall, he's going to have trouble in the overlap area. Well, exactly how much depends on, uh, on how various things, which we don't need to discuss. But it says there's a key requirement which is a big, it is a standard principle of parallel computing, namely parallelism works if your problem is big enough. 
And each platinum has a, has a sort of criteria for size. And I've suggested that, he, that for bricklaying by uh, the techniques used 2000 years ago by Hadrian, that, uh, that, uh, criteria, that criterion is it says that um, the problem has to be large, each sub problem has to be bigger than a few meters in size. Um, when we look at the how fast we can build the wall, well, the uh, and the, here we're making an assumption which is true for computers but not for people that everybody runs at the same speed and does work at the same rate. That's not true for people, but it is true for most computers when you have a homogeneous cluster. Then you will easily see that the uh, amount of work done is decreased from a perfect amount, which is the number of bricklayers, um, which is a factor of n, the number of bricklayers faster than before, and it's reduced by a factor which is sort of the ratio of the overlap length to the total length. And this is a formula which, if you look at classic computer parallel, parallel computing, you get such a factor, except it's not the ratio of, a, of, a dis, of these two distances, it's the ratio of a time spent communicating, because when computers have to negotiate at the edges, they have to communicate. And uh, so the amount of information to communicate, uh, the time to communicate, and divided by the time spent doing the computing. And uh, as the bigger the subproblem gets, the bigger the computing gets, but typically the overlap does not go up as fast. Um, <clears throat> Amdahl had, had a law which is misstated and it's, it's pretty controversial, but it, it uh, people, sometimes people concluded from Amdahl's law that parallel computing wouldn't work. And that is incorrect. Parallel computing does obviously work, otherwise people wouldn't build supercomputers and big data computers, they do work. And um, the, the Amdahl's law, when it was originally stated, did not uh, properly distinguish between big, big problems and little problems. And uh, where they said it didn't work was a small problem. And the point about small problems is they don't take a lot of computer time, so you don't actually need to paralyze. <coughs> so parallel committee says, if the problem is big, you need to paralyze it and it will work. Here's an amusing uh, aside. This, uh, there was a well-known phrase, at least in English, that too many cooks spoil the broth. And that's what happens if you try to build a wall too fast um, with a given number of bricklayers and the wall is short, those bricklayers will interfere with each other. And so this uh, statement, too many cooks spoil the broth, isn't true if you have a lot of broth, because you can assign each cook to a different, um, different uh, canister of soup. So this is an important issue. You only, you need large problems to get good parallelism, but only large problems need parallelism. So it's sort of okay. Um, here's another interesting comment, which is also true. Yeah, here we have this wall and we have the parts of the wall. Now, if you were assigned to build the wall, you would know what you needed to do. You would have to learn how to get bricks. You would learn how to spread the mortar between the bricks and you'd have to put one brick on top of another. Um, what happens if you're part of a team building the wall? Well, you do exactly the same thing. However, what is changed is the geometry Then you're building the sub part. So you have sort of a jagged edge. And, and the geometry, so it's the smaller than the original wall, and it has different boundary conditions. That is also true with computers. When we do map reduce, each of those mappers is running the same job that the sequential code would run. <coughs> Sorry, I was imprecise. These slides are from 1984. They're still quite old, 36 years old. And it, uh, in those days, we, we used to use things called hypercubes, which uh, was mentioned here, but that's effectively a cluster. The hypercube was the first cluster, uh, which we built at Caltech. 
in K. And you can see we programmed in Fortran. The people who program in Fortran for the jobs we were studying then now program in C++. Now uh, here is another interesting point. If you look at the issues with doing parallel computing, you have some issues. So one issue is inhomogeneity. I mean, not all the problems are the same. And you could see that if you had walls of um, different height, you wanted to build sentry areas where sentries could stand, which were higher, that would, would, then you would need to spend more work um, on the high parts. And so you would actually need uh, to have smaller lengths of the high part compared to the lower part. Uh, so that's called load balancing and irregular geometry. And if you look at the history of parallel computing and the technology, the worries about these issues are there's lots of work on load balancing. Uh, here is another case which is um, uh, you could not only have different sort of a rather simple change, namely the change in the height, you could decide you wanted to decorate the wall. Here are some pictures on the wall, and those decorations would take more time. And um, to try to build a wall which had this structure is pretty hard because you don't actually, well, they're hard to do it efficiently because you don't actually know how long these structures will take to, to install. And so it's probably better to do it dynamically. And there were many, you can see back in 1983, 1984, we were using neural nets. So we were quite modern. Uh, we published papers on neural nets for this problem, for optimizing this problem in those days. So, but actually the method here, some other methods like spectral bisection were probably better. But anyway, um, so here you are and here is another, so another interesting feature about parallel computing is that the computers communicate with messages. And it's important, people don't like messages because they seem ugly and clumsy. They prefer shared memory, but actually uh, it's much more efficient to build messaging. We can't, we don't run the world with a shared memory, although uh, we actually getting nearer that model with the, uh, instantaneous news that we get these days. Everybody sort of has a shared shared collection of uh, information, although it's so much of it is possibly everybody gets a different part. But um, if you look at either brains or collections of ants, they are all made, made up of message passing systems. The axons and dendrites in the brain are sending messages. Uh, ants, when they communicate and try to act as a colony of ants, they are sending uh, messages by, by dropping chemistry on the ground, which tra chemistry transmits from hand to hand. Another important problem is if we look at um, big data, we need to have some um, IO to get the data to the, no, do we have these maps which are doing computing? Well, they need to be given some um, data and uh, that data has to come in parallel. In the case of um, bricks, the parallelism comes from having multiple trucks, each with a different bunch of, um, of uh, bricks. So that's again, pretty similar. So this just summarizes everything that so we have from parallel IO, using messages, problems are large, there was an issue about topology of the processor matches that of the problem. I skipped that slide. It's, it's in the longer discussion of the recorded lectures. So if we look at um, parallelism, we have all, I've already pointed out that actually you see parallelism in different fashion. We have parallelism over usages and users. So a user is, for tweets, each user is a different parallelism. But the users are doing tweets and searches and each of those are the tweet and the, sending a tweet and issuing a search or going to Facebook or <coughs> Instagram, those are different usages. So 
we have to look at, and we both parallelisms are very useful. With science, we don't often get parallelism over users because we're not studying users. We're studying typically kind of physical systems and or, or engineering systems. And so we normally do, we don't usually get the opportunity to do parallelism over users, although in some sense we do it. There's the so-called long tail of science, which is really a, a claims that for some science, like uh, some of the environmental and biological sciences, there are lots of users, lots of scientists doing independent things and the progress in the field comes from summing up over, which is the reduce operation over those different uh, scientists. That compares with the physics problem, the Higgs problem, where I told you there were 3,000 3, scientists on one experiment. In environmental science, there are 3,000, well, some number, say 3,000 environmental scientists, each doing a different part of environment in the environmental science area. So that's the difference between big science and little science. <coughs> and uh, again, you see when you do this uh, sort of long tail of science and lots of users, the maps of the, each user doing their thing. And then the reduction is adding up the results of all the users, which typically you would do. You would accumulate results from multiple users. Maybe one environmental scientist studies, studies squirrels in the Hoosier National Forest and another environmental science studies elks in the uh, in Yellowstone, and then you add the results together to, to study the impact of um, climate change on, on, um, on nature or something. Um, and clouds are pretty useful because they're the shared resource, which is in the middle, which brings everything together. So share the issue, you need to have a, you need to be carefully deployed from shared capabilities. It's not necessarily a shared memory, it's a very local shared system, but you do, the cloud is essentially a shared environment. <coughs> um, so this um, slide here actually summarizes precisely what you do in parallel computing and where you take the data set, you divide the data set up into parts uh, then the parts of process, which is the maps. If, the, if everything is independent, it's pleasingly parallel. If it's what I call globally parallel, then the parallelism requires communication between the different tasks. And that's uh, the hardest problems are globally parallel. Um, fault tolerance is not so important in science. If the, if the problem, if the computer crashes, we just rerun the job typically. Um, in big data, um, fault tolerance is more important because you tend not to rerun the data. You accumulate, you, you, back, you back up what you do and restart. And this is a slide which nobody likes, which I show from time, quite often, because I like it, nobody else does. And it's a bunch of squares, which are some feature of computing. <coughs> Sorry, I, my, my throat is a bit uh, dry. And um, we have three broad classes of problem. We have loosely coupled, those are like the map only, or just map reduce, where the different parts of the problem are not closely connected. And that's over here. Then over here we have things like the uh, computational fluid dynamics problem for studying the air, uh, um, a plane flying, flying uh, in the atmosphere, where due to turbulence, we have to do a very complex parallel algorithm. Um, in the big data, graph problems are like this. Graphs are very difficult to run in parallel because they're so irregular. And to get the graph problem running efficiently in parallel, it's pretty tough. Uh, another stand, whereas um, deep learning is in the middle because although it uh, needs a lot of parallel computing, the problem is actually pretty straightforward. It's so-called data parallelism typically is used and you just chop the data up into parts. You have these uh, uh, mini batches or batches and you run each of them separately on a 
particular node of your computer and then add them up. There are also other forms of parallelism, but the data parallelism is the most efficient. Where so if it gives enough parallelism, is parallelism is what you use. Um, <coughs> if you um, do things like latent Dirichlet allocation, which is a big data approach for um, topic modeling, that is pretty challenging because the data is very, is very, the algorithm is pretty sensitive to the structure of the data and people have found it uh, hard to write efficient parallel algorithms. You can, all of these, it's sort of interesting, people have been able to solve all these parallel computing problems. Computers have not, so the, you end up with this People think people don't like that most high-end parallel computing is done by individuals. It is not automated, and um, so that's what they have user-performed parallelism. Whereas that, that data parallelism, the user has to choose data parallelism, but there's not a lot of work the user has to do to make it run well. They just have to invoke Coravad or their favorite uh, data parallel um, <coughs> software. And that doesn't have to do anything terribly deep. Um, okay, so we. Uh, I think this is a good time to stop. I will finish off. Uh, I, this is. I thought I'd finish because we had this wonderful section from uh, Gregor at the beginning, so I didn't <coughs> have quite as much time as I expected. And so I'll stop now and see if there are any questions. Well, I see the chat is, uh, there's nothing in the chat. Any questions, people? Yeah, just for uh, the students who are there, I've updated the website uh, with all the reports and everything. So everything is up to date. And also I updated the example, the first example with the proper image. Uh, so now we have two examples that have proper image inclusion in it. So if you read, if you read the uh, canvas, it will, I posted all the remaining homeworks, which are all effectively devoted to the project. And uh, it is important you show us you're still, uh, still around and do uh, some sort of work every week to demonstrate that, uh, that you're, you're, you are involved in the class. And we will give participation points for GitHub activity each week. Okay, if, ask, if there are no questions, we'll sign off. Otherwise, please ask, uh, please ask a question in the chat or by audio. All right, goodbye. Thank you, everybody.